Hello everyone, and welcome to After Alexander. Episode 29, Temples and Cylinders. Today is going to be a slight deviation from the impending return to Anatolia to discuss the building projects and other large tasks that Antiochus I worked on throughout his reign. I've made this into a separate episode because I wasn't sure how else I would have been able to shoehorn these projects into the narrative. With that, there are a few such projects I'm going to go through in turn. Among others, we're going to focus on the Antiochus Cylinder and the rebuilding of Borsippa, as well as some of the cities that Antiochus I founded and why. So, first, the Antiochus Cylinder. This is actually tied in with the reconstruction at Borsippa, so I'll cover the two of them at once, before moving on to cover the other big reconstruction project. The city of Borsippa was situated on a lake, just shy of 18 kilometres to the southwest of Babylon. It first shows up in records during the so-called Ur III period, which lasted from about 2112 to 2004 BCE, and was a period of unity under a Sumerian Empire. However, during Borsippa's history, it was largely a satellite of the nearby and larger power of Babylon. Like the rest of the Middle East, Borsippa and Babylon fell under the thumb of the Achaemenid Persian Empire after the Neo-Babylonian state was defeated. In 484 BCE, a rebellion broke out in Babylon under two men called Shamash Eriba and Belshimani. Babylon had become unhappy with Persian overlordship since their state was absorbed in 539 BCE, and eventually the two kings were simultaneously declared to the north and south of Babylon, respectively. Babylonian records supposedly only note down Belshimani's period of rule for two weeks. Given the brevity of records, he was probably either defeated or joined forces with Shamash Eriba. However, the Persians defeated the rebellion in October 484 BCE and regained control. In this counter-revolution, the temple to Nabu in Borsippa, which had first been built by order of Nebuchadnezzar II in imitation of the ziggurat in Babylon, was demolished. For context, Nabu was a prominent deity in the Babylonian pantheon and a god of vegetation. Supposedly, Nabu wrote down the fates of humans with the stylus and tablet he was known for. The city of Borsippa was holy to Nabu, so I can well imagine this destruction would have devastated the local community. Fast forward a few hundred years, and this is where Antiochus I comes into the picture. The temple was rebuilt during his reign, and he laid the foundations for the Ezida temple to Nabu himself. In commemoration of this event, a cylinder was inscribed in Akkadian, which has survived to the present day and is currently in the British Museum. I'm going to quote a reportedly new translation of the Antiochus Cylinder from the Akkadian, present on the Livius page called Antiochus Cylinder, written by Bert van der Speck. The Livius page specifies that the translation will be published in I. L. Finkel, R. J. van der Speck, and R. Perengruber's Babylonian chronographic text from the Hellenistic period. Quote, Antiochus, the great king, the mighty king, king of the world, king of Babylon, king of all countries, caretaker of Ezagila and Ezida, foremost son of Seleucus, the king, the Macedonian, king of Babylon, am I. When I desired to build Ezagila and Ezida, the first bricks of Ezagila and Ezida in the land of Hatti with my pure hands I moulded, with fine quality oil, and for the laying of the foundation of Ezagila and Ezida I transported them. In the month of Adaru, on the twentieth day of year 43, I laid the foundation of Ezida, the true temple, the temple of Nabu, which is in Borsippa. O Nabu, lofty son, the wise one of the gods, the proud one, who is eminently worthy of praise, first-born son of Marduk, offspring of Eroa the queen, who creates offspring, regard me joyfully, and, at your lofty command which is unchanging, may the overthrow of the country of my enemy, the achievement of my triumphs, the predominance over the enemy through victory, kingship of justice, a reign of prosperity, 
years of happiness, and the full enjoyment of very old age be the gift for the kingship of Antiochus and King Seleucus, his son, forever. O son of the Prince Marduk, Nabu, son of Isagila, firstborn son of Queen Eroa, at your entry into Ezida, the true house, the house of your Anu ship, the dwelling of your heart's desire, with rejoicing and jubilation, may, at your true command, which cannot be annulled, my days be long, my years many, may my throne be secure, my reign long-lasting, on your sublime writing board which sets the boundary of heaven and earth. May my good fate constantly be established in your pure mouth, may my hands conquer the countries from sunrise to sunset, that I might inventory their tribute and bring it to make perfect Ezagila and Ezida. O Nabu, foremost son, when you enter Ezida, the true house, may good fate for Antiochus, king of all countries, King Seleucus, his son, and Stratonike, his consort, the queen, may their good fate be established by your command. End quote. There's a few things of note in the inscription which I'm going to unpack a bit here. First of all, the column was created in the Seleucid year 43, which will refer to either 269 or 268 BCE, depending on the point of the year, as discussed in previous episodes. Specifically, the exact date which would correspond with the Babylonian date listed is the 27th of March 268 BCE. This demonstrates that Seleucus the Young King was still alive at this point, indicating he died sometime between 268 BCE and his father's death in 261. It's another piece of the puzzle to bear in mind about the young king. I'll cover all of this in more detail in the next episode. In addition, another interesting point to note is that the stylus and tablet of Nabu are mentioned, and Antiochus I was essentially asking the god to grant him long life and prosperity with his power of determining fate. Also, note that his other son Antiochus isn't mentioned alongside the two co-monarchs. As we'll discuss in more detail in the next episode, there is some speculation about his royal role during this period, so it is interesting that he isn't mentioned on the Antiochus cylinder alongside his father and brother. Anyway, back to construction projects. Over in Babylon, Antiochus laid the foundations for the reconstruction of the Isagila temple which was dedicated to Marduk, Babylon's home god, while also reviving the local culture and celebrations in order to act as a counterbalance to Persian culture. Now, Babylon had essentially fallen by the wayside in comparison with Seleucia on the Tigris, which was most likely founded in either 307 or 305 BCE. Its founder, Seleucus I, had helped it to prosper by moving the royal mint to his new capital. Although Antiochus restored the culture of Babylon somewhat, he is also supposed to have landed a killer blow to Babylon by moving most of the population of Babylon to Seleucia in 275 BCE. Next up, Iconum. There was historically some debate over whether Iconum was actually identical to Alexandria on the Oxus, one of the many, many Alexandrias founded during the conquest of the Persian Empire by Alexander the Great. However, there has, apparently more recently, been a shift towards the idea that this city was actually founded by Antiochus I, half a century later in 280 BCE. Now, Iconum was at a good position, sitting as it did between two major rivers at the periphery of India. It benefited from the presence of the nearby Oxus River, meaning that, as with Egypt and the Nile, the city got a big agricultural boost. Its proximity to the Hindu Kush region also meant it was close to mineral resources such as rubies and gold. Moreover, it sat at the crossroads between Bactria and the northern nomads, which indirectly allowed the city to be able to trade with China. Nor was it just Iconum. Antiochus I was, in the best tradition of his father, a prolific city builder. A good example would be Apamea Sibotus, which sat on the east-west trading lifeline of the Seleucid Empire. He also encouraged the foundation of cities in the area of Iran in order to combat the threat of the Parthians. This drive for creating new settlements extended to Anatolia over in the west as well. Now, John D. Granger lists nine cities created in Anatolia during the period of activity from 271 to 261 BCE, in which cities were created or expanded. 
This included six fortified settlements, and four of them were most likely the amalgamation of previous smaller settlements into cities. The fact that Antiochus's new foundations were basically military in design highlights how disturbed and in flux the Anatolian Peninsula still was. The Seleucids used construction projects to their advantage, supporting their authority in the region and trying to counteract the encroachment of the Ptolemaic dynasty. However, these construction projects were also a way of not pushing the Ptolemies too far. It happened discreetly and wasn't too provocative. After all, Antiochus had just been defeated by Ptolemy II in the First Syrian War, so he wouldn't have been too keen to get entangled in a second conflict if he didn't have to. I'm going to highlight three settlements at this point, as the first two support the point made above, and the third is a little quirk of Seleucid propaganda. First up, in the Sea of Marmara, one of the islands in the Bosphorus was given the name of Antioch and made the headquarters of a regional fleet. Although it probably wasn't around for very long, it highlights the fact that the Seleucids were attempting to roll back the Ptolemaic tide. Second is Antioch on the Myandros, created from the combination of two existing places. Now, the reason why this city was important to the Seleucids is that the Myandros Valley was the location of a bridge, which was part of the Royal Road. In brief, the Royal Road was a path leading from the Aegean Sea to Iran, which had been created by the Persian king Darius I, who ruled in the early 5th century BCE. This same road would also be used by Alexander during his conquests, and was now, as a result of Seleucid regional dominance, part of the Seleucid kingdom. This road was a lifeline to the Seleucids, and thus several of the cities which were created or recreated, such as Antioch on the Myandros, were founded with the purpose of solidifying Seleucid control over the road. This level of control would also fit with the idea that settlements were founded in Anatolia to counteract the Gauls. The Gauls were far from peaceful, and both they and the Pisidians in the south were capable of severing the royal road. As such, the Seleucids would have benefited from protecting it. Third, there's Apollonia. The only reason I really bring this up at all is that it captures the importance of the god Apollo to the Seleucid dynasty. Antiochus I claimed to be his paternal grandson, as we've discussed in previous episodes, and he was apparently the dynasty's favourite god. As Bevan notes, and as we covered before in episode 28, we can see a mix of Ptolemaic and Seleucid names in Anatolia, which is reflective of the First Syrian War in the region. Now, before I dive back into this, I will note that Bevan says it's almost impossible to discern Antiochus I's contribution to construction projects, given that his role has basically faded out of history again. To that end, this is going to have to be more of a discussion of Seleucid construction projects in general, rather than specifically focusing on Antiochus I. Cities with Seleucid names can apparently be found along the two major travel routes connecting Syria with the Aegean Sea. The first of these routes is the one that was contested with the Ptolemaic dynasty at this point, namely the southern coast of Anatolia. The second route is the Royal Road, which I mentioned above. New Seleucid foundations were constructed on junctions where other roads joined the main Royal Road. The first such places Bevan discusses are Laodicea the Burnt Up, which is where a road joins from Cappadocia, and Apamea, which sits at a central crossroads for all of Anatolia. From there, the road split into two. The first one headed towards another Laodicea which overlooked the Syrian gates while the second of these two roads apparently saw a lot more traffic moving across it, and so there were more cities and they were closer together along this route. Bevan lists three places along the road, all named Antioch at one point or another, which are each a day's travel removed from the others along the roadway. So, that's a brief overview of Antiochus I's construction projects, and also the city-building situation in Anatolia. I've deliberately avoided going into a lot of detail with the cities, as we would be here all day otherwise. Next time, we're going to turn to a figure I've alluded to several times already, and who's featured briefly in this episode. Seleucus the Young King, co-king with his father from approximately 275 BCE, and the eldest son of Antiochus I. His life is a confusing picture, 
but I'll provide a simplification for the narrative at the end. Until then, thank you all for listening. Feel free to get in touch at the show's email address for any questions or comments. Until next time, have a great week everyone.